and welcome everybody here in Twitch chat and everybody on YouTube for a special episode today. We are going to have the top 10 cards that I would nerf if I was in charge of um, deciding what to happen in patch 2.11 that's going to be coming out this week. We're all expecting a lot of changes to be happening here for Le the Legends of Runeterra metagame. It's been a solved metagame for the last few months with decks like Thresh Nasus, Aurelia Azir, Draven Ezreal, Lissandra Trundle being um, the top tier decks for a long time. Our last balance patch that was a month ago um, really didn't, uh, you know, <laughs> didn't really solve anything. And uh, people weren't too happy about that patch. And, and Riot said at the time that they were too focused on the future and weren't paying enough attention to the present and that they apologized for it and that there were going to be a lot of card changes and balance patch changes coming up in patch 211 with the release of the new expansion, Rise of the Underworld. Um, so that's coming up this week. So what's going to be changing, we don't know yet, but this is what I would kind of recommend. So 10 cards to nerf, 10 cards to buff. This one right here is going to be about cards to nerf. So let's get to it. Okay, number 10 on our list of cards to nerf is going to be the 7 through 10 mana Celestials. So this isn't, again, this isn't just one single card, but all four of these cards have the text, when I'm summoned, grant me plus one, plus zero for each celestial card you have played this game. And I honestly kind of think that that's just a little overkill. And I think that the game would be a little bit better if that was taken away. So this is like the one thing that I would nerf right now with the Celestials and Targon. And, you know, this would hurt star shaping and Aurelian Soul a little bit is um, just kind of get rid of that text from all four of these cards. I think all four of these cards are very good cards and they're they're worth playing uh, like all the celestial stuff and, and the invoke cards and you're know, trying to invoke these these uh, units. Um, but I don't think it really needs that. Like a 7-7 seven, seven overwhelm spell shield for seven is good. It doesn't really need to be like a 13-7. You know, same thing like, you know, this is a very difficult card to kill and I think it's perfectly fine at six power and not, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, you know, however much power you get with that other stuff. Um, you know, this thing, you know, Elusive with Fury and Spell Shield, and it's already an 8-8. Eight, eight. You know, it doesn't need to be a 13-8, you know. So I think that could be just a nice little change, um, one small change for the top end of um, Targon um, is just removing that from each one of those. All right, for number 9, we're going to be talking about the Cythria Spectral Matron combo. It's really, really powerful at the top end. And I think it could be tuned down just a little bit. Now, um, with that being said, Cythria here is a 10 mana unit. And I do think that ending game, I think, think there is some value in ending games. And if you're casting a 10 mana unit, you should be able to end the game, right? Like, cause you know, we don't want games to go on forever. We don't want to just, I know we just talked about like uh, nerfing some of the invoke top end. We just, we don't want to just nerf, sorry, nerf every single, uh, top end thing and then you just can't ever win a game right like that's that's not what we want to do but i think that some of these top ends are just a little kind of over the top compared to the other regions and what other regions can do and i think cythria um is that and so like cythria of course says when i'm summoned double other allies power and health and grant them challenger really where this is problematic is with spectral matron where you know you have Spectral Matron round eight, or if you use cost reduction even earlier, that puts Cythria into play. It's a summon ability, the doubling power and health and giving them challenger, super, super powerful. When you look at like your other eight, nine, 10 mana uh, units just in the game, there's nothing else that's like doubling all the power and health of like things in play, also giving them a keyword. You know, like there's Bright Steel Formation that give them barrier, like that's kind of comparable. But uh, that that seems pretty amazing. So what what I would kind of recommend for this though, as far as changing this card, is I think that if this was a play ability, I think that would be uh, the way to go. Because you you do want like the ten mana card to end the game, and I think Cythria kind of still ends the game if you are playing it. Um, you're doubling all the power and health of your allies. That is incredible, and of course granting them challenger also incredible. So I think that that would be better um, than how uh, Spectral Matron allows this to be summoned and it being a summon effect it, it would you know kind of be a nerf on the card um you know wouldn't be a, as good and wouldn't work as well with like war mother's call and other things like that 
but I think that would be a, a good change. Because um, this this combo is really difficult to stop. It's really powerful. Won a tournament this weekend um, and just looks great. And so that would be the change that I'd make to Scythria. Another option is you could also change Spectral Matron. And honestly, you could maybe do both. And I would kind of recommend doing both because Spectral Matron is also a problem because, uh, you know, you have it with the Watcher. But the thing with Spectral Matron is before Scythria and before the Watcher, Spectral Matron really didn't see any play at all. But with that being said, even if you just nerf like Watcher and Scythria and, you know, and you, then you're thinking, okay, well now Spectral Matron will go back to a card that's like very fair if you don't have those kind of broken finishers. It does... Um, limit your design space moving forward because like how is that going to be just every single time you want to print you know an eight nine ten mana finisher do you have to think okay well how does this work with spectral matron you know like scythria and so on do you, does it just kind of like limit how you're designing your cards for like the entire rest of the, the time that you're making cards you know like that's that's probably not a great thing either so maybe something sh should kind of change with spectral matron and uh in chat somebody had a good suggestion for this because i wasn't really sure what to do with this card um and i think this this could work out is like what if spectral matron was a six six fearsome still play pick an ally in hand summoning but then instead of summon an exact copy of it that's ephemeral you just actually summon that card that's ephemeral so you just actually so like if you have spectral matron scythria you would just actually summon the scythria from your hand into play make it ephemeral you know, because, you know, you can't just, like, summon things for, for free and not, not have any kind of cost whatsoever. But then you don't have, like, that card still in your hand. So if you choose it with the Watcher, you wouldn't continue to have the Watcher in your hand. And I think that's honestly a, a probably a pretty good change because you are getting something that uh, is, you know, putting a ton of power into play for 8 mana, depending on what you're choosing. And if you're using that with units with, like, Last Breath or units that are already ephemeral, you can get some cool little combos with that anyway so i think that could be a good change as well so i would actually kind of recommend changing both cards both scythria to be a playability and then spectral matron to just summon the exact card in hand so just summon it and it's ephemeral instead of making a copy and so then that will kind of help um alleviate the pressure of um spectral matron reducing the the uh the ability to make cards in the future but even with that being said, even with the nerf to Spectral Matron like that, I still think that it'd be beneficial to nerf Scythria to make Scythria play instead of a summon because of just how powerful that effect is with Scythria of it being, um, you know, doubling the power and health of all of your allies. That's just, that's an incredible ability. And I think that an ability that powerful should be on play and not on summon. So there we go. So that's going to be uh, number nine on our cards to nerf. And number eight and number seven are gonna be two cards to nerf to kind of hold back Draven Ezreal a little bit. And the first one here is gonna be Tribeam and Probulator. So Draven Ezreal is a really good quality deck and it's it's a difficult deck to kind of determine what kind of nerfs to do for that deck. It's been really good for a long time. It's incredibly efficient. But it also doesn't really have anything super obvious to kind of nerf because um, most all of the cards in the deck are going to be like pretty good in other decks. Like I don't really want to nerf Ezreal or Draven uh, or things like that. But I think I have two targets that I think that could um, make the deck a little weaker, but not, you know, obviously like whenever we're nerfing decks, we don't want to just like kill them completely. So Tribune and Probulator, this is a good suggestion, again, from somebody in chat. I was you know, trying to think of what to do with this card. I think it kind of makes a little bit more sense at 5 mana than 4, but actually, um, we're going to change something else to it. So, of course, what it says is, you know, you deal 1 to a unit, summon a random 1-cost follower. And then, of course, that can increase whenever you're playing your 3-cost cards. So this card does have um, some, like, deck-building constraints. You, you really need to play a lot of 3-cost cards for this. But the Draven Ezreal deck does have a lot of three cost cards that it wants to play. And it also um, alleviates some of the pressure of having a Tribeam and Probulator in the deck with um, efficient cards like Rummage, where you can find Impribulator earlier 
with um, like the card draw that it has. But then also if you if you draw in probably layer late, or it's a very bad draw late, you can have like your rummage that discards it and finds something else. But as far as like the, the deck goes, this is kind of the thing that can be really, really unfair in the Draven Ezreal deck, right? Because it's it's only four spell mana and it can do a lot of damage to a unit. So it's a very good hard removal spell um, for some very large units, but then it can also get some amazing followers. Plenty of times I've I've, I've had my opponent uh, cast this on four, deal four damage, and put in the six five from Bilgewater for four mana. That's uh, that's happened quite a bit. Or you can even go more extreme. I've definitely had opponents you know get Leviathan and Captain Farron and Bright Steel Formation and just some ridiculous stuff with this Tribeam and Probulator. And so all that can can happen, and it's. It's just kind of absurd the the swings that you can get with Tribune and Probulator because it's not only four spell mana putting something ridiculous like a Captain Farron into play, but it's also dealing eight damage to a unit, so it's also killing your best unit. Um, but like I said, we talked about how you do have to play a lot of three-cost cards for this, and it's not a very good top deck in the late game, but the upside of this is kind of absurd for what you can what you should expect for a spell. So as far as a suggestion on like what to do to nerf this, um, I I had kind of the ideas, a couple of different ideas of like like I said like turning it into a five mana spell instead of four mana because it's kind of like on par, you know, make it a little bit more on par with like your concerted strikes and you like your five mana because five mana is really where you get to like kind of more hard removal type spells. Um, that was one option. Another option would be where it has to deal like. These are two separate things. It does damage to a unit and it summons a follower. Maybe another option is to like make those um, link them where it has to deal damage to a unit in order to summon a follower, right? So like if your opponent, so like if if you cast Tribeam and Pribulator on something and then your opponent on that thing that you're casting it on casts like Glimpse Beyond or Homecoming to get rid of it, you know, a card like that that gets rid of it, or they use their own removal spell on their own thing and get rid of it, something like that, then it would fizzle the Tribeam of Probulator and you wouldn't get the follower. That's an option. Another option is that, you know, maybe you just, instead of deal four to a unit and summon a random four cost follower, I'm just picking out four as a number, maybe you just summon the random four cost follower and whatever its power is, that follower then strikes a unit. So that would add even more RNG to it because sometimes like your four cost follower could be like a five, four and you're dealing five damage, or it could be like a one, four and you're dealing one damage. That's something you could do. Not great, but I mean, these are just all different options. However, what I think would be the best change to this card more so than any of those. And this was again, an idea by somebody in chat is that um, we're going to change this card to make it better with Heimerdinger and better with just different types of turrets in general and make it so instead of summoning a random one cost follower let's get rid of some of this rng and have it summon the random or it's not random sorry but summon the one cost turret the tech so like whenever it deals one you get the the one one the if it deals two you get the two one tough you know just like how heimerdinger makes like the turrets for whatever mana you spend this could do the same thing. So then you would kind of know what you're getting. For three mana, you get the three one fearsome and so on. And that could give it some extra utility, you know, with like some of the other tech cards and Heimerdinger. And it also would kind of take out some of the RNG and uh, you can also kind of plan around it, right? So a lot of times you would maybe want your Improbulator to do six damage because you want the six one elusive turret. And you could you could try that like with your Draven Ezreal deck to try to get that six one elusive turret. Now, of course, um, a six one elusive turret's pretty valuable it's attacking for six but it's also a little easier to kill for um, somebody who's getting their thing uh tribeam and probulated of course you can also try to go for like the eight plus and anything and and maybe change it so any eight plus would always make the eight eight um t hex just like how heimerdinger always makes the eight eight t hex so if, if it does go to nine or ten or eleven you're like if it goes to eleven you're not just stuck and you get nothing because that's kind of weird so like you'd get your eight eight still um I think that, that could be really cool. It's like a way to, um, you know, keep the Tribeam and Probulator good, keep it, you know, keep it very playable, kind of remove a little bit of the RNG from it um, and, uh, you know, make it make it a little more fun. And also kind of, you know, that would buff up Heimerdinger a little bit, right? Because you could get, it'd be another way to put turrets into play to level up your Heimer. Um, 
and things like that. So that could be pretty cool. So that's that's the change here I'd recommend for Tribeam and Probulator. All right, number seven and the next card, number six, are going to be two cards that maybe not a lot of people will agree with. But these are two cards that have been a lot around since the beginning and have been pretty controversial. They've been um, in tons and tons of different decks. We're starting with the first one here with Ravenous Flock. This is, I think, the only other really card that with the Draven Ezreal deck to maybe kind of nerf. And I think that I've thought about it a lot, and I think it does kind of deserve a nerf. I think one mana for four damage is just, it's too high on the power level when you compare it to everything else that's dealing damage. Um, I know you do, it, it is limited, right? You can't just do spend one mana, deal four damage to anything. It has to be a unit that's damaged or stunned. But as we've seen, it's not really that difficult to have a unit that's damaged or stunned. But what Ravenous Flock does allow is it allows you to trade up mana um, in a really, really efficient way way because it's only one spell mana and as you know spell mana is a lot easier to spend than unit mana and so one spell mana if you think about just like all of the different one mana spells in the game one spell mana is really not doing very much normally um, as far as dealing damage goes one spell mana usually deals one damage like a blade's edge um, but just you know like a parlay can do one damage so having one spell mana deal four damage is just pretty uh, you know, it's a pretty drastic change to what any other one mana spell can do. Even when you go to two mana, um, getting to getting to like three damage for two mana is pretty difficult. You got to have like a, a gotcha that's enabled um, or something like that. And so even though there's this clause for damage or stunned, I, I think that this should probably change. Because how this trades up with mana, just kind of talk about that a little bit more. You know, like you have like Shivana, Victor, you know, I'm just thinking of like four mana champions. This can, you know, you can have your um, Sentry and then Flock, that combo. And for one mana, you're killing a Shivana, you're killing a Victor. You know, you're killing any three mana champion in the game. Almost, I guess not a Zir or Soraka. Okay, well, most three mana champions, most four mana champions, not all of them. Even like the five mana cards, like five mana five five is a very base stat for a, for a five drop. You know, you have like your regular cards like Avros and Hearthguard there to that. You have like your Gangplank, your Garen for champions. There's there's a good amount of champions that are three sixes at five mana, but five mana five five is kind of like the baseline stats there. Ravenous Flock, all you have to do is do one damage to any of those five fives. That's blocking with a little one one spider or having one damage from a Death Lotus or from whatever. And then you can just combine that with a one mana Ravenous Flock and take out five mana champions. And it's just too efficient at what it's doing here. So there's two ways that, that I... So I do think that this should be nerfed. I, I do. I, I've thought about it a lot, kind of gone back and forth on it. But I do think it just compared to everything else it, that it's too efficient and it could be nerfed just a little bit. I don't want to just kill the card. And there's two ways to do it. And I think either one makes the card still very playable. I think you can have it have still stay at one mana, but only deal three damage instead of four that's still way above the curve, right? Like there's nothing else at one mana that's dealing three. And it's also difficult for two mana to deal three. You have to really work for that again with like a gotcha. So I think that that could work. But, beca but because of Swain, this is Swain's champion spell as we know. And Swain levels up from dealing 12 damage. So I think that they want to keep the four damage with the flock to kind of help with Swain. And I think that's, a that's acceptable. But I think that for four damage, I think you still have to spend two mana instead of one. For how cheap spell mana is, um, I think this makes sense more at two mana for a spell than four mana for a spell. So that's what I'd recommend here is Ravenous Flock go to two mana, keep it at four damage to be able to help Swain, you know, keep that Swain level up better. And um, so then you're at least spending two mana plus like whatever other little thing you're doing with stunning or damaging for uh, taking out three, four, five mana champions. Um, so th those would be the two cards that would affect in Draven Ezreal, the Tribeam and Probulator and the Ravenous Flock. At number six, we have the other card that's been around for a long time, just like Ravenous Flock, that's been a part of a lot of different decks, um, and that's Ravenous Butcher. And I think that with the recent cards that have been coming out, I think it's kind of pushed Ravenous Butcher over the edge. And what I'm talking about is the different slay cards. You have the Sharima, um, one mana, one two, that rewards you for slaying, that uh, gets buffed up every time you slay. Um, 
you know, basically the thing is like the Thresh Nats package. You now have like the new, besides Curse Keeper, you have now Fading Icon, the new two drop that makes the zero one that allows you to play this very easily. You also have Doom Keeper making the Sand Soldier, allowing you to play the Ravenous Butcher on round one very easily and attack for five on round one. I think there's just too many ways, too many cards that have now made Ravenous Butcher too good at zero mana for three two. Um, it can just, it makes some some busted Shadow Isle starts just too busted in my opinion. Um, I think it has been fine for a lot of the time. I don't think this is a card that has needed to be nerfed before. But I think as we're seeing with, with Thresh Nasus now and just like the, the different cards that have been printed now and obviously just all the ways that you get rewarded for slaying, um, you know, with especially with Nasus, Kindred, stuff like that, it's, you're just you're getting paid off too much for too little, right? Like you're not spending any mana at all. You want to kill your own allies in a, a lot of the times and you're getting a 3-2, which is very aggressive. And so I, I would recommend changing this card. Now there's two ways to change it. Again, exactly like like Ravenous Butcher. The first way, first one way is to just in, increase the cost, make it cost one mana. So you, like you got it, you got to spend a mana because one mana for a three two is still very good, still ahead of the curve. There's only one one mana three two, I believe, the Legion Rearguard, which has the downside of it can't block. This has the downside that you have to kill your own ally to play it. A lot of times that kill your own ally though is a bonus, so it's not much of a downside. Um, but it's not something you can usually do right away on round one very often. I wouldn't really recommend doing that one though because they printed the uh, Wings in the Wave. I believe that's the name of the card where um, the Wings in the Wave is a one mana 3-3 three, three to like the wave part that, to play it, kill your own ally. So this would just kind of be a, str a, a strict downgrade on that card if you, if you put it at one mana. So I don't think that really works. So I think we're looking at the power and health. And right now with Shadow Isles, um, you know, you have the Curse Keeper making the 4-3, you have the Fading Icon that's the 3-1, you have your Spirit Leech is a 4-1, you have a lot of cards that have a lot of power compared to health right now, and they can, it can, the busted Shadow Isle starts can just attack for a lot of damage immediately. And I think maybe reducing the power of Ravenous Butcher will just reduce that just a little bit, right? Because I don't want to like kill regions, you don't want to kill decks, stuff like that. But so if we reduce the power of Ravenous Butcher to be a 2-2 instead of a 3-2, you're still getting paid off like where you're getting an absolutely free 2-2. You do have to kill an ally, but like like we've talked about, that's a bonus a lot of times, especially with like Curse Keeper. Um, but I think that could just slow down the Shadow Isles just a little bit. So that's what I recommend here is make Ravenous Butcher a 2-2. Yeah. You could then kind of think of it similar to like with Targon has a card that's a zero mana 2-2. Two, two. If you have a Celestial, it would be kind of like that, like where it'd be a zero mana 2-2, two, two, but you have to kill your own ally. And for how for how beneficial it is to slay things, again, with like that uh, Bakai Reaper, that's the name of the card, the 1-2 Fearsome, and, you know, having Curse Keeper, Fading Icon, all this stuff, all these reasons for you to want to slay your own units, you know, Nasus. Um, I think let's slow that down just a tad, making Ravis Butcher a 2-2. Two, two. So those are two um, older cards, Ravenous Flock, Ravenous Butcher, these Ravenous cards, that I think are a little too efficient these days um, for like the other cards that have been kind of printed around them. So that's number six. And at number five, I'm kind of cheating here a little bit because I'm putting two cards together here because I had a little bit more than 10, so we had to put two cards together. I'm going to do that here at number five. We're going to talk about two different one drops that I think would be uh, good targets to nerf. First of all, Dune Keeper. Dune Keeper is incredibly good. It's in both Aurelia Azir and Thresh Nasus. And the reason why I think that Dune Keeper uh, should be nerfed is because it has the ability to attack for four on round one. We uh, affectionately call this card round one decimate. And uh, I think that's too much. I just don't think that you should have a one drop that can attack for four on round one. Of course, right now with Ravenous Butcher being a three, two, you can even sacrifice the Sand Soldier, and this allows you to attack for five on round one, which is even more. Um, there's no other one drop that attacks for four on round one in the game. I think it's too much. I think three is kind of the cap of what you should be able to do on round one, and you, you kind of need to work for the three, in my opinion. Um, so the way to so the way to nerf this, in, 
what what I think should happen is just change the the um, power and the health of the Doomkeeper. If this was a one two instead of a two one, then it's attacking for one. Your Sand Soldier is able to do two damage, and you have your three power that you're attacking for on round one. I think that'd make a big difference in the card. We see one twos with upside. Um, all over the game, there's a lot of different uh, one mana one twos that have a little bit of upside, and I think that that, that would be perfect for the Dune Keeper. So I think you want to keep it with the two bodies, like that helps out Azir and a lot of other things. It has the Sand Soldier attacking. There's tons of Sand Soldier um, synergies and everything. Um, it's a good card to have later on because it can it, it be two bodies attacking or two bodies blocking later on. But I think it's a little too good at 2-1 and would recommend it going to 1-2. I think that would uh, level that out. And then for the other card here on number 5, the other one drop is going to be Sparring Student. And this is going to be kind of similar um, where Sparring Student, getting the plus 1 plus 1 for each card as we've seen playing against Aurelia Zier, can get this thing to be incredibly large and make it just impossible to block. And so it's a it's a card that you that you have to block because it kills you if you don't, because it's frequently a 6-6, six, 7-7, six, seven, seven, eight, eight, and so on. And so you have to block it because that's way too much damage to your Nexus, but you can't ever, ever uh, block it profitably. What I would kind of recommend here, and so I, I think that, that I think that kind of needs to change, right? Because it's a one mana unit. Uh, so I think that what we could do here is make it like Green Glade Duo and a lot of other um, one mana units that uh, have the ability to just add on to the power, but not the health. It's the health buff that really gives, just really puts us over the top because then you can't ever block it because it never dies because of the health buff. So we you have other um, one mana units that, that buff up the power. But a lot of them are 1-2s. And so I think that's what we could do here to kind of make up for that. Let's make Sparring Student a 1-2. And then whenever you summon an ally, give it plus 1, plus 0 this round. Okay, so, so it's not a 1-1. One, one, it would be a 1-2. And so then it would be like your um, Bakai Reaper, Flower Child, Green Glade Caretaker, Astute Academic. I just kind of went through and looked at a couple of them. Those are all like 1-2s for 1 mana that have different clauses for buffing up the power. And I think that Sparring Student could just kind of join that party but make it a one you know one two buff up the power so it can still attack for a bunch so it's still going to be like attacking for seven so you're like oh man i gotta block this because it's like a seven two now but you can at least actually trade trade with it and it, considering it's only a one mana card you should probably be able to trade with it <laughs> so uh, i think that could be a good uh nerf for aurelia azir yeah. at number four we have merciless hunter which is just a card that Ever since it was printed, like whenever you first read this card, everybody knew, okay, this is just over tuned, right? Like they just pushed the power level of this card because I think that right at the time wanted to push Sharima, um, wanted to make uh, Sharima better. And this just does too much. For three mana, you get a four three, which is kind of bigger than any other three mana card, but that's not enough. Let's give it a keyword, fearsome, a very good keyword, makes it difficult to block. And then let's make it even more difficult to block because we're going to have a play ability granting any enemy vulnerable. So basically make this a removal spell as well. So you get a larger unit than you normally have from a follower. You get a good quality keyword. And then you also get a removal spell all attached to one thing for a common. This card's just too pushed. <laughs> it's very obviously too pushed. When you compare it to champions like Callista at four mana fearsome that doesn't do anything until it levels up, this is better than like a level one Callista. This is better than um, a Nocturne. You know, Nocturne, you ha you have to have Nightfall to turn on the to give something vulnerable for <laughs> Nocturne, and it's only a five three for fearsome. And it's four mana. Like it's difficult to turn on Nightfall for a four mana card. You know, you maybe have to wait till round five six before you can actually play something and then Nightfall with it. This you just get it round three immediately. Yeah, this is a little overtuned when you look at it kind of compared to some other champions even. So what I'd recommend doing with this card, um, that play, grant an enemy vulnerable, is honestly a really powerful thing to have for a three mana card because you're getting to pick and choose exactly what you want to have vulnerable. When you look at like um, a card like Hired Gun, Hired Gun is just giving the strongest enemy vulnerable Sometimes, you, a lot of times you want that to be the strongest enemy to have the vulnerable, but there's a lot of other times that you don't want it to be the strongest enemy. You know, maybe you want, you need that Zoe to be vulnerable, not, you know, whatever 2-1 they played or, you know, other card. Um, so, you know, you get to pick and choose. Very, very, very valuable. 
and you get like this this fearsome keyword to make this more difficult to block. So you, you can also like maybe they only have like one blocker that's blocking fearsome and you get rid of that blocker. So now you get to have your merciless hunter attack and deal nexus damage. So there's different things to do here. And I would honestly change two things about this card. A lot of people would only change one thing, but I, I would honestly recommend changing two things. So there's, you know, so it's a 4-3, which I would recommend just going to a 3-3. And I think a lot of people, that's what a lot of people in chat say, like, let's just make this a 3-3. Boom, we're good. But honestly, I would get rid of that keyword fearsome as well. I think that this should just be a 3-3 with no fearsome. And I think it's still a very good card that you're still putting in your decks. It still curves perfectly into Renekton and Sivir and does exactly what you want with granting the enemy vulnerable to help out your Renekton and your Sivir. Because uh, those are like champions that are at four mana that you want to be challenging uh, different units. I think it's I think it's still great like that. But I think the fearsome is overkill, and I think that the uh, the four three like get rid of that fourth power. Um, so those are the two changes I recommend for this card. Uh, yeah, I think I really do think that it's so powerful that it kind of deserves two nerfs immediately. And I and I think even at at three three with that ability, I think that is still very very playable and still very good at uh, three mana, and it's worth it. So Merciless Hunter is number four. And we're finally at the top three of our list. We're going to have three champions, uh, three of the very best champions in the game that are a part of the best decks that are kind of dominating the format. First up is going to be Nasus at number three. Not too much to change about this card. I think it's a you know, it's a very strong card how it is. I've already talked about maybe having Merciless Hunter and Ravenous Butcher nerfs, and you're thinking, oh man, you're really you're really hitting that Thresh Nasus deck. But remember, Thresh Nasus doesn't even need to play Merciless Hunter. It's such a good deck. You just play you can just play Blighted Caretaker, even one one Blighted Caretaker, it's still gonna be a very good deck. So how are we really um affecting this deck too much? Again, we don't want to kill decks, but I don't want to be like after this patch where everybody's still just playing Thresh Nasus because like things have been nerfed on the on other decks and it's still just you know top of the metagame. Um, we we should probably hurt it a little bit more. So let's talk about Nasus here. So there's a couple of different things you could do with Nasus. One could be like maybe there's like a cap for this ability, such as um, whenever you've maybe when if you've slain eight units, then give it plus eight plus eight. So then it goes turns into the ten ten, and then it strikes for ten. I don't think we, you know kind of like how Vi is like uh, how Vi gets capped at eight kind of thing. You could do that kind of thing. What I think though that I, what I would recommend, I would just keep level one Nasus how it is, and what I would change here is the level two Nasus and specifically this keyword. So whenever it levels up, it gets Spell Shield. And I don't really understand why. It doesn't really make sense for it to suddenly have Spell Shield. Even lore-wise, it doesn't really make sense. And I just don't understand why that's here. That's what I would do, is just remove the Spell Shield from the NASA. So even if it levels up, it's still, you're getting an absolutely huge champion, right? Because it's like at least 10 power. And you're also having all of your enemies get that minus one, minus zero, and it's fearsome. It's a very good card. The spell shield is just kind of a little overkill. So that's that's what we're kind of that's kind of the lesson of today. Getting just a little tweaks to some of these cards that just have a little bit of overkill to them, whether it was you know like the celestials or other things like that. So that's what I recommend. The level two, the level three Nasus. Let's just remove that spell shield. Give your opponent a little bit of a chance for killing this absolutely huge monstrosity of a champion and staying in the game. At number two, we have Azir, another new Sharima champion. Kind of see some of these new champions are maybe a little overtuned. Of course, Aurelia Azir is a uh, deck that's just been dominating since it's come out, right? The, the synergy between Blade Dancing and Sand Soldiers, it is really, really strong. So what are we, what are we going to do for this deck? We kind of talked about Sparring Student. Um, so far, that's basically the only change. I did at my honorable mention say that you could maybe change the Aurelia Blade dance the duet to just be blade dance one instead of blade dance two then again think about it more duets kind of like a two not a one so maybe just change the spell to be two mana instead of one mana but anyway back to at hand we have azir so what's the problem with azir so azir one five hard to kill that's cool you could change it to like one four or something i don't think you need to do that though i think it's you know you want to make you know you don't want to like kill azir you want it to be a good card 
the level two, getting that plus one, plus zero for everything. Pretty awesome. And then you get your Emperor's deck. Cool card. What I would recommend here with Azir, the thing that I have a problem with, and I th the thing that I think makes it too good, is this sentence here. Level up, you've summoned 10 units. Summoning 10 units is, especially when you're playing a card like Azir, where you're playing Sand Soldiers, summoning 10 units is so, so easy, it's ridiculous. You, it's just, it's going to happen round three, round four, round five, every single game. You're just going to ha already have some in 10 units, especially in a deck with Blade Dancing and stuff like Aurelia Azir. But even in a Buried Sun Disc deck, where you're just playing like Sharima cards, it's still not difficult whatsoever to summon 10 units. So this is what I would recommend changing, is just make it more difficult for Azir to level up. Because it, sh it shouldn't just be... Like, not, not consequential whatsoever to have just your champion is just always leveled up, right? Like, if you look at just across the board all the other champions in the game, it's not very easy to level up champions because leveled up champions are really, really powerful. And no, you know, that's not different for Azir. Azir leveled up is very, very powerful. So it shouldn't just be, okay, well, do you want to play Azir? Well, then it's just leveled up immediately. That's not very good. You know, if you think about like Aurelia, the other champion in the deck, Aurelia has to attack with 12 units. This just has to summon 10 units. It's so much easier just to summon 10 than attack with 12, just if you, you know, it's just numbers, <laughs> right? All right, so how would we change that? So there's there's different ways to change it, but the one that I would recommend, honestly, I think that what I would, what I would try with Azir is make this level up be where I've seen you summon 10 units. And I would keep it 10, even though it's a scene, I wouldn't even change that. I don't think it has to, I don't think that number has to be moved down. I think that it's so easy to summon units, especially when you have the Emperor's Dias and this that are making sand soldiers, and you have Doomkeeper making multiple bodies, and you have um, like the blade dancing that's putting all sorts of stuff into play. I don't think I don't think it should be super easy to level up your champion. I think you can have this be where Azir has to see you summon 10 units before it levels up. That would make it a little bit more difficult to level up your Sun Disc, yes, or you know, to level up your champion for your Sun Disc, but not, you know, not, still not that difficult <laughs> when you're talking about Sand Soldiers and everything like that. So that's the change that I'd really like to see with Azir. And, you know, things can always be adjusted, right? Like we've seen a card like Ezreal be adjusted multiple, multiple times. You can always adjust. But I think that's where I would start with Azir, where it's not just you play your Azir on round four and it's already leveled up whenever you're casting it on round four. That's kind of silly. And that's that's what I think is a big problem. So let's try it out. So I've seen you summon 10 units. So once you play your Azir, that's already one. So now you only need nine more. And then if you attack immediately, you get your Sand Soldiers. That's already another. So you only need eight more and so on. And so you just got to be playing some more units with your Azir out. Keep it at the five health. Make it still kind of difficult to kill to... Um, you know, make it where it can live long enough to see 10 units. And we're here at number one, the card that needs to be nerfed more than any other right now in Legends of Runeterra. It's Lissandra. This card is insane, as Twitch chat just said. It's the three mana card that does everything, said Arroyo, and that is absolutely true. Wow, this card does way too much, and I don't know what they were really thinking with printing this card. I don't know, but um something's got to change here and um this is what i would recommend to do all right so let's talk about lissandra so first it's a three mana two three it's got tough very good keyword for a champion one of the better keywords for a champion right because with champions you want your champions to not only you whenever you play them you want them to stay alive for a long time because the longer a champion's in play means the easier it is to level it up because you know it's got to stay around a while and then it's going to be doing its level up thing and that's basically the same of every single champion across the game you want your champion in play. And so tough is a great keyword to have to keep your champion in play. lissandra has got that. All right, so what else does Lissandra do? So it also has a summon ability. So it gets you another resource whenever you play it immediately. You get the Frozen Thrall um, that, of course, with all the different advanced cards and everything can be great and you know can be good in, in different aspects. So you get an additional resource immediately whenever you play Lissandra. Then whenever you have your Lissandra level up, which, as we've seen with different decks, is really not that difficult. You'd think, you know, summoning two plus allies that cost eight plus mana, that sounds like that's difficult, but um, all the different Lissandra decks you've seen, like Lissandra uh, Trundle and Lissandra, like Talia, like those ones, 
not too difficult to level up Lissandra. So whenever you level up Lissandra, what do you get? One, you get your Nexus is tough. I don't know like how many, like what, if you, if you had like a spell that said your Nexus is tough, I'm not sure how much mana that would be worth. Like if that was like a card, like would you spend five mana to make your Nexus tough? Like a burst spell that did that. Possibly, like if you think about like, you know, star shaping heals your Nexus for five, of course you get something else. I don't know, four mana, three mana, not sure, but that's, that's definitely worth a good amount of mana. Like that's a really powerful ability. And then you also, round start, get to create a fleeting ice shard in hand that also costs zero mana. So you get a, th you get a three mana spell every single round, but then you also get to make it cost zero. And this ice shard is devastating um, for people, you know, people trying to play units and attack and kill you because, um, you know, your it's not dealing damage to your Nexus. It's not dealing damage to your Lissandra. If you have other units, it's probably dealing damage to them, but it's dealing damage to all your opponent's stuff because they're probably not tough. And so you get to do that every single round, round after round. Um, so it's basically, you think of it's like one damage, but it's basically two damage in like the intervals of like whenever you get to attack. So um, whenever you have the attack token and you attack, by the next time you get to attack, you all of your units have taken two damage from two ice shards. And uh, so that, that really makes it difficult to have different waves of attackers. Then you add that to a tough nexus, makes it really difficult to kill somebody. But that's not enough. Also, whenever your Lissandra leveled up, by the way, you also created this Watcher in hand, which is just another resource. So you not only get to the resource of the Frozen Thrall whenever you play the Lissandra, you not only get the um, Nexus Tough, which is a really good resource that's just absolutely free, you also get, uh, you not only get the, all the free Ice Shards, every single round you're getting an additional resource with these Ice Shards that are zero mana, that are very useful, you also get this Watcher, which is just a completely ridiculous game-ending threat, the very best game-ending threat in the entire game. All of that for just your low cost of three mana. That's it. This is just, does way, way too much for a single card. Watcher, of course, has this attack ability, obliterate the enemy deck. You can't interact with that. There's no, there's no denying it. There's no, you know, anything like that. Like, you can't, you can't stomp it. It's not, it's not a skill. It's just, you're, you're gone, your deck's gone. Thanks for playing. Um, yeah, just way too much. All right, so what would I do to, to change this card if I was in charge? Um, <laughs> but wait, there's more. All right, so there's, I would actually change a couple of things. First things first. Uh, the, okay, so it makes the Frozen Thrall, cool. That kind of makes sense. You know, you have this leveled up ability. I like it. When, once it's leveled up, it's making these ice shards. These ice shards are devastating. They really are. This is the most underrated part of this card. This, I, these ice shards are devastating. I don't think they're necessary. That's the first thing I would do. I think with this card, you have to either get, it can't get, it can't give you all these resources, way too many resources for one card. You have to get rid of the Watcher or the Ice Shards. You have to get rid of one of those. It's just too many resources. And the Watcher is flashy and everything. It's probably not like, even though I know a lot of people would want you just to just get rid of the Watcher completely, and I would be happy with that. I don't think that's what Riot wants, right? It wants this flashy thing in there. Okay, cool. So we're keeping that. So that means that I think ice shards have to go. I mean, you I don't think you can just have all of those resources for free. It's just not it's it's not just it's not a realistic thing for a card. I don't know how this was printed to begin with. But anyway, so first things first, ice shards gone. You're not this this whole text here, round start creative fleeting ice shard in your hand, gone. Okay? So that's the first start. That's the first step with Lissandra for making it reasonable. Okay, so no more ice shards. Now Let's talk about the Watcher. So we're gonna keep the Watcher, but I honestly think this Watcher needs to be nerfed a decent amount. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna kind of keep it similar, right? We don't I don't want to like get rid of it completely, but it's still I'm gonna keep it the seven seventeen mana, eleven seventeen. I cost zero if you have cast four plus ally or you've summoned sorry if you've summoned four plus allies that cost eight plus in the game. I'll keep that all the same. However, this thing I would really recommend changing, this attack obliterate the enemy deck, because there's just no um, no ways to really stop that, right? Like it's, 
you know, you can stun the watcher, you can eat, you know, you can silence it, all that kind of stuff, but that, that works on, on other things. We're talking about a card that you got for free from Lissandra that once you, once you play your eight plus cost units, your four eight plus cost units, sorry, it costs zero mana to cast. So you're not spending any kind of resources on this watcher. You got it for free and you're playing it for free. There's no opportunity cost. I guess that's the best way to put it. There's no opportunity cost for you playing this watcher. It's just it's just all gravy, right? You know, like you're getting it for free and you're and you're playing it for free. So it's not like it's not like you had to like put a whole bunch of like watchers in your deck that cost 17 that if you draw them early on against an aggro deck you lose the game no you just put lissandra in your deck if you draw lissandra against an aggro deck sweet you got this really good tough blocker that's awesome right so there's no opportunity cost to this so therefore with zero opportunity cost you shouldn't also get absolutely amazing payoff which is what you do right now you get game winning payoff with zero opportunity cost those two don't really those those don't really make sense together, right? Like there's got to be some some yin with your yang, right? You gotta gotta you know have a little bit of opportunity cost with your game winning ability. So instead of having this be an attack ability, you could put it as a skill, so then you can deny it. But still, you're getting off way too easy with like this watcher. If you even if it's like a skill, what I think that the best thing to do here, if we want to keep the card looking like this, is to make it where it's a nexus strike. So Nexus Strike obliterate the enemy deck. That makes it where, okay, that's difficult to do, right? Because there's no keywords on this. There's no Overwhelm, there's no Elusive, nothing like that. You can put a little Spiderling in front of the Watcher and you don't get your Nexus Strike. However, I think that's still, a, I still think that that makes the Watcher incredibly good. And I also kind of think it makes it even a little more flavorful because first of all, again, you're getting a zero cost 11, 17. You shouldn't be complaining too much. But second, you're going to be able to attack with that 1117, and it's basically impossible to block profitably. So it's it's a card that just essentially kills one like your opponent's worst unit every single attack step, right? Because you have to throw something in front of this watcher. So you just keep on throwing like your 1-1, your 2-2, your 3-3. So every single round, your watcher is just crashing against them, killing a unit. And so it, it kind of like gives you like this um, feeling of inevitability like where you're just trying to stay alive through this watcher that keeps crashing against you. That's kind of cool just flavor wise, like with this watcher anyway. But next, it does um, incentivize you to try to get that Nexus Strike to happen, right? Because Nexus Strike will obliterate the enemy deck. Maybe you're just cool just having like this vanilla 1117 that's just crashing against them and just making them sacrifice their weakest unit every single attack step because they have to just keep on getting rid of one of them every single round. Maybe you're cool with that. But maybe you want to actually try to get this Nexus Strike to happen. So that could incentivize you to play cards like Might or Cato the Arm or whatever you want to use to be able to give the Watcher Overwhelm. Or maybe you want to, or maybe you're in like um, an Ionia region where you want to try to give this Elusive or with Piltoverns on how you can give it Sumpworks Map with Elusive, right? So then you start playing like these, these other cards that you wouldn't normally play in a Lissandra deck because you try to get your Watcher to be able to Nexus Strike. Maybe you want to play um, Dragon's Rage, right? That Dragon's Rage has your unit strike the Nexus, boom, obliterate the enemy deck. Those are all cards that are pretty fun to, to have in like a game and just like in a strategy. And they're cards that, th those cards do have opportunity costs, right? Because those are cards that don't always necessarily um, add very much value depending on the state of the board. And um, and so like those those are cards that like they have fun play patterns like kind of attached with them and they have the opportunity cost like I was talking about and so they're uh, they're cards that do kind of add a little bit of push and pull to it so you know you don't have to play those kind of cards to make Watcher good but there are cards that could make Watcher better uh, depending if that's what you want to do so overall I think that would just make this a much healthier card so that's that's what I recommend here for Lissandra. Let's make this Nexus Strike obliterate the enemy deck. Therefore, you really have to work for it if you, you know, if you want to obliterate the enemy deck. But if you don't, you still get this incredible, incredibly powerful 11, 17, zero cost unit. They, by the way, you got for free. <laughs> you know, it's not like, it's not like, you know, like if this is your only game plan of winning the game, maybe, you know, have your 8-8 overwhelms that you're getting also for free with your frozen tombs, you know, maybe let them do a little bit of work or something, you know. Um, all of that. 
And I would also just get rid of the whole ice shard thing. So there we go. Then we would have like a, a, a champion at three mana that I think is a little bit more reasonable than what it is now. All right, so that's my top 10 list of cards to nerf. Those of y'all watching later on YouTube, I want to see those comments. What cards I leave out? What cards would you nerf? Also, what do you think of, of these crazy ideas that I had here? What do you think of this Watcher nerf or the Azir or just any of these other cards that I was nerfing? I want to see those comments over there on YouTube, and of course, I'll respond to them. You got other ideas? You got your, your crazy ideas? Let me know. Up next, we're going to have the top 10 cards to buff. So what are some champions or other cards that could maybe help out some champions to buff? Um, that's That was a, more difficult to figure out than finding cards to nerf, so uh, make sure you watch that one too. But as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you for the next video.